Welcome to Auto Complete. This is Roadshow's weekly podcast about the intersection of cars and technology. I'm Brian Cooley, editor at large for Roadshow, joined as usual by Tim Stevens, our editor in chief. And we kick things off this week with some breaking news as of today, the Thursday we're taping this show, which is that there is now a new agreement between the federal government and 20 car makers who account for basically every car made and sold in the U.S. to install automatic emergency braking no later than the fall of 2022. And Tim, this is a big piece of safety tech along the lines of uh, supplemental restraint airbags and ABS and stability control. It also comes from the world of self-driving cars. Absolutely. This means that these cars will have to have some more sensors on board to be able to detect collisions and automatically break from themselves. But ultimately, we've seen these systems starting to roll out and trickle out into cars now. They're having a really big impact. Cars with this sort of technology are a lot safer to be had. You know, they can help to save a lot of accidents and uh, save a lot of lives, too, which is great to see. So having them mandated in cars, I think, is a good thing. We've got 20 manufacturers, as you mentioned, who have signed on right now. Not until 2022, though, which is uh, quite a ways away. But then again, we only just got ABS regulations required in cars just a couple of years ago, yeah, along right. with traction control. So that took well over a decade, almost two decades. So I guess it's to be expected. Yeah. So the, uh, there are critics of this, actually, who say that because this is an agreement and not a formal rulemaking regulation uh, that went through the usual rulemaking process, mm. they feel it's a little bit soft and maybe one where the definition of how automatic braking works at each car maker is going to vary somewhat. So the critics over on the safety side are, are concerned that this is loosey-goosey. The feds say if we'd gone with formal rulemaking, it would have taken several years longer to get this in place. And so they say, look, it's expedient. Uh, I guess we have to wait and see exactly how each car maker implements uh, emergency braking. But I, I mean, common sense, I can't imagine this isn't a major, major improvement. Yeah, it's definitely a step in the right direction, even if it isn't going to be on every single car out there. But again, you have to remember that these cars take uh, on average five years to, to develop. So even a car, even this regulation goes in place in six years, that's still cutting it pretty close for a lot of these manufacturers who don't have this technology already. Companies like Maserati, for example, one of the 20 that signed on. So, uh, you know, they've got to develop this technology or go to a third party more likely to pick up the tech and bring it in house. Uh, that's going to take a time. But yeah, it would have been nice to see it across the board. And, and who knows, maybe we'll get there a few years later. But it looks as though it's almost every car by uh, September 1, 2022, and then by September 1, 2025, for you truck drivers, uh, they expect to have the same uh, agreement that all production vehicles, or almost all production vehicles, will have this technology or at least offer it. So there's some details there about exactly what is standard and what is available that are, of course, part of what's to be seen from each car maker and part of what some of the safety critics uh, feel is a little bit porous there. Um, by the way, some numbers on this. The, uh, the consensus is that the automatic emergency braking, once it's fully deployed uh, over a number of uh, coming years after this takes place, could reduce as many as one-fifth of all accidents could be avoided with this. Uh, of course, the, the huge number of those are going to be rear-end collisions, and I would imagine the huge number of those are going to be distracted driver rear-end collisions. So thank you, smartphone. You just ushered in <laughs> automatic braking, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, you got to take your excuses where you can get them to get this sort of yeah. technology in a car. So ultimately, it's That's a good it. thing. But yeah, obviously, distracted driving is a huge problem. Uh, and hopefully, this will help for other collisions as well. But yeah, obviously, rear endings are a big, big issue. And this will make things uh, a lot easier there. Yeah, and frankly, I'm not so uh, I'm, I'm not so eager about having it. Not in my '88 Ford my, anytime soon. <laughs> but definitely, I'm I'm eager the other guy having it because this is the accident right. that I dread the most. Sitting Absolutely. there and seeing some guy behind you, it's like, wow, do you really see me? You're closing really fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about Dieselgate. There's not noth nothing substantially new for the consumers in the U.S. this week. Uh, the next shoe to drop is going to be the uh, pending March 24th deadline we've been telling you about, where the Ninth Circuit Court uh, Judge Justice Breyer wants to see uh, the Volkswagen show up by that date, a week from now, with a satisfactory plan for EPA and for California. But in the meantime, um, for those who are following the inside baseball on this, the head of Volkswagen in North America uh, exited after just six months on the job, and he was the crisis guy who was brought in, Michael Horn. So it, it just doesn't look good over there right now. No, and we're coming into the New York Auto Show next week, which is right when that uh, that mm -hmm. expected date is going to hit. So we're expecting more kowtowing from Volkswagen, but whether or not we get anything more yeah. concrete, uh, that remains to be seen. I would love to see VW come right out uh, and give us a lot of details on exactly what they want to do. The dates certainly line up nicely for them. Uh, so if they wanted to do that, that'd be a good opportunity. Uh, but ultimately, you know, at every auto show since this all started to break last year, it's just been a lot of apologies and some kind of half-hearted uh, attempts at uh, winning people back, but no actual concrete details here in the U.S. anyway. 
anyway. So I'm hoping in New York next week we get something, but uh, I'm not exactly holding my breath. Yeah, okay. We'll be on top of that for everybody who's watching and has a Volkswagen uh, or Audi product, uh, are the primary affected vehicles in the U.S. and a few Porsches. Uh, what's going on here also is that we have three possible plans for you that are shaping up in concept. Uh, the rather remote possibility that they would buy your car back. The uh, more mainstream possibility that they would have a fix to change hardware and software in your vehicle to get it to be compliant. And then more recently, we've heard talk from some regulators saying, look, let's be pragmatic here. They may never get this thing fixed right and buybacks may not be uh may not be feasible we may just have to grant a waiver to a lot of these cars and let them live out their life on the road polluting in which case they're also going to pursue of course heavy penalties against volkswagen group to sort of offset that with a fund that would then promote clean vehicles while these six hundred thousand cars are anything but uh let's see uh, the uh, tesla model 3 of course has no emissions this is going completely the opposite way we're still on track for some big days ahead tim with uh, a march 31 formal unveil of the model 3 uh down at their la uh, uh headquarters design studio uh you'll be there i think is that right Right. I got my invite this week. The event's in just a, about two weeks from now. And they did say to expect to go in a spin in their latest creation. So that doesn't mean they will actually have a functional car there. At least that's my interpretation of that language anyway. We weren't really sure what to expect given uh, how far away we think the Model 3 is still going to be. Uh, I wouldn't have been surprised if they just rolled out some pictures of the thing and never actually showed us an actual car. Um, but the, they did say to expect to go for a spin. So that's a good, uh, a good thing. So that means that there's something that's rolling anyway. Looking forward to trying that out. Uh, getting a feel for what exactly they have to show, but we really don't have a lot of information to go on other than a silhouette that looks a lot like a uh, slightly smaller Model S. There was also some uh, supposedly leaked images of a supposedly uh, mid-sized crossover uh, SUV from Tesla that's coming down the road this week, uh, which I don't put a lot of faith in, to be honest with you. I think we're just expecting a, a four-door sedan, a smaller car like the Model S. Uh, that's what I'm expecting to see on the 31st, but um, I'm eager to get behind the wheel. Okay, so until we'll be there on the 31st, be covering for us uh, from Roadshow. We'll have breaking news that day. Uh, that's an evening Pacific time event. Is that right, Tim? That's right. Uh, I think it's 7.30 Pacific is when things get going, so it's going to be a bit of a late night if you're on the East Coast or, I happen forbid, even in Europe. It's going to be a, yeah. especially late night, but we'll do our best to bring the news to you as quickly as we can. Yeah, so we'll have that for you on the 31st, and the next day, we understand, is when Tesla will open up their online pre-orders for $1,000. You can uh, take a reservation place in line to get a Model 3. And just to recap, for those that are trying to keep track of all these Tesla models, this is their uh, BMW 3 or Audi A4 competitor, supposed to be about a $35,000 car, and uh, apparently that's even before incentive. So they're, they're, they're really shooting at Chevy Bolt price tag, uh, price targeting. Is that is that how you understand it? That's right, but they haven't really said exactly what range you should expect for that, that money. Even mm -hmm. if you can get out the door for a $30,000 Tesla, as we've seen with the Model S and the Model X, uh, you can certainly option those up quite a bit. Uh, they offer multiple levels of battery pack right now, the 70 and the 90, and you look at a pretty substantial cost increase as you go from one model to the next. So it could be more like a forty dollars to $45,000 car if you want the full 200 or, or, or plus uh, range on the thing. That remains to be seen. The uh, the Tesla, or the, excuse me, the Chevy Bolt is going to be 200-mile range for around $30,000, $35,000. Um, this may be more to get that full range, but but even so, a Tesla at thirty thousand dollars, even if it doesn't have two hundred miles of range, that sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, this is uh, this is definitely showing, among other things, that the Bolt with a B uh, <laughs> is looking like the EV to beat this year. I mean, that's that price and that range. No one else is able to quite put that together. So we'll see if they can do that, or if, like you mentioned, it's going to be a tiered battery level where you got to spend another who knows six, seven, eight thousand to get the higher range car, as is often their style. Uh, interesting move by General Motors, a lot of interesting moves by them lately as they first <laughs> invested and then swallowed up Lyft, and now they've got uh, an in, uh, a acquisition of a company that a lot of folks didn't know about called Cruise Automation. They made a really interesting clip-on, if you want to call it that, a rig you'd put on the roof of an Audi A4, $10,000 you'd pay for this rig. It would wire into the sensors and the solenoids of the vehicle and create a highway self-driving car out of it. It was a really interesting uh, startup add-on kit for, again, just uh, just one model of Audi, but GM liked it so much they bought it reportedly, according to Recode, for a billion dollars, that's a nice piece of change, yeah. to apparently accelerate their ability to put in self-driving. But I got to ask you, Tim, I mean, General Motors has a lot of resources, lots of engineers, lots of software, lots of partnerships. What do you think that they had to get from a company like Cruise that they couldn't do within the traditional supplier universe?
I'm kind of shaking my head at this too. I mean, a billion dollars for a company with 40 employees that makes one very, very, very niche product. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed by this myself. Uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of money for, you know, a very interesting technology. As you mentioned, the idea that you could retrofit an existing car to turn it into at least a semi-autonomous machine is pretty interesting. We've seen retrofit kits for, of course, uh, stereo systems and heads up displays and things like that. But this is very, you know, taking that to the next, to, to the next level. But so it's hard to imagine exactly what GM is getting out of this that they couldn't have gotten simply by hiring some very talented people, presumably for a lot less than a billion dollars, even if uh, that is if that number is inflated. Even five hundred million dollars seems like a lot of money, but um, you know they're certainly looking to get technology, looking to get a better footprint in Silicon Valley, and to get in on uh, you know next generation of technology. GM has been very progressive, as you mentioned, the investment in Lyft as well, uh, to kind of get ahead of the curve when it comes to whatever this next generation of personal mobility is. Uh, they want to make sure that they're well positioned. Maybe this gives them uh, a better foothold. Yeah, or they paid twenty-five million dollars ahead to get the staff. I mean, <laughs> yeah. engineers are pretty pricey these days. Maybe that's the going rate. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so. Everyone's talking about the startup bubble bursting, but if you're an automotive startup, it seems like uh, there are good times ahead for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's no, no bursting re remotely coming. It doesn't seem in automotive uh, software and uh, sensor integration as well. Another interesting headline around GM uh, this week in this sort of modern transportation bucket. They've got an agreement with Lyft. Of course, they've been doing a lot of stuff with Lyft since they've uh, made the move on that company, where if you want to drive a Lyft, but you own a crappy car right now, you can get a nice new GM car for $99 a week. It's really more of a rental than it is a lease because it's short term and do your Lyft driving with it. Uh, and again, this is a deal made available if you are using it to do some Lyft work, not just to the average person. And if you do 65 rides a week, if I understand it, it's actually free to have a General Motors car. I don't know exactly which models are going to put in this hopper. So I guess the idea is if you want to drive Lyft and your car doesn't make the cut, too old, too ratty, too dangerous, uh, this is a way to recruit drivers. I didn't know it was, uh, it was that hard to get drivers with decent cars, but maybe it is. Yeah, I mean, Lyft, I think in general, uh, not to be stereotypical, but it does seem like Lyft drivers have so much less nice cars than uh, Uber yeah. drivers in general. But ultimately, this is a really good deal. I mean, even if you just don't want to put too many miles on your existing car, it probably makes financial sense, especially if you're doing a lot of rides in an urban area, that kind of thing. You know, it's, a, it's a great deal. Yeah, I could even see people going on vacation and picking up a couple of people on Lyft and just yeah. to get a free car for the week. It could work out pretty well. Yeah, this, this is a short-term thing we mentioned. It's, uh, I believe it's for a total of eight weeks. It's not something you can just do all year. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be a great price if you're getting like a, you know, a Chevy Cruze for 100 a week. That's no deal. But the idea that you can drop in and out opportunistically on a car rental that has a new General Motors car and a possible way to pay for it while you use it. Interesting mix. Just goes to show the lengths at which car companies are going to try and find new ways to invent the use of their cars in this whole area of smart mobility. Which, speaking of smart mobility, we've got uh, the finalists in the uh, – federal government's Smart Cities initiatives, the contest to win $50 million for a given city to win that, to implement a plan of smart city transportation, largely around self and smart driving uh, initiatives. The list is Austin, Columbus, Ohio, Denver, Colorado, Kansas City, Missouri, Pittsburgh, Portland, and San Francisco are now made the final cut of seven to go on and be the one winner. And, uh, you know, the, what struck me about this is it's a $50 million prize, and if you're in one of those larger cities, that's not a lot of money. <laughs> I'm not sure that's really going to dramatically improve uh, someone's, uh, a city's ability to roll out smart driving infrastructure, is it? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely, we're talking about a lot of uh, sensors that need to be installed to basically build the vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communications that are going to be required, uh, you know, hundreds of sensors that are going to be needing to be installed, smart lights we're talking about, um, you know, systems within the government and within the, the municipal DOT to be able to report things like potholes, closed roads, uh, detours, that kind of thing. There's a lot of logistical challenges involved, but ultimately, you know, this is definitely something that cities are going to have to do. So, if they can bring in $50 million to help offset that cost, uh, all the better. Um, I was actually there in Austin when they announced these finalists, and as you can imagine, they were all pretty excited to be selected, especially Austin, given that's where we were. And Secretary Fox himself was very pumped up to be announcing these. And he actually went so far as to say that everybody who entered this competition will be getting some sort of federal assistance uh, to help them bring some sort of smart technologies to their cities, obviously on a $50 yeah. million dollars worth, but some help anyway. And uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see exactly what comes of this, but $50 million is probably not going to be enough to get them over the hump. 
it should be a pretty good boost anyway. Yeah, it'll help. Uh, by the way, each city that made that list of seven that we mentioned does get a, an initial payment of $100,000 to finish and polish their presentation to pay for research and such. And as Tim mentioned, it's a blended prize. $40 million of that win will come from DOT or, or federal government. The other $10 million, by the way, comes from Paul Allen, the Microsoft co-founder from back in the day. And he's got his uh, Vulcan Ventures wing is called Vulcan Phil uh, Philanthropy. He's been putting uh, you know, a fair amount of money into, apparently, well, certainly with this, into the idea of smart mobility and smart transportation. I did not know he was behind that until uh, until this development on this one. So that's interesting. Um, that's interesting. The feds are going to be, uh, by the way, as you were talking about on CBS this morning this week, uh, trying to be one of the uh, one of the partners that brings simplicity and clarity to the rules of how we test and deploy self-driving cars. What's the gist of that? Basically. Uh Chris Hermson from Google and a bunch of other industry leaders were in Washington this week trying to trying to basically plead to get the federal government to step up and create some standards for autonomous car testing in the U.S. Because right now we've got six states in which it's legal to test autonomous cars and it's kind of nebulously legal elsewhere as well. But there really isn't any standard defined regulations around these cars around the U.S., which is making testing more difficult for them. In some states, you need a special license, like in California. Other states, you don't need a special license. Uh, there are different regulations about what kind of equipment you have to have in cars. And of course, there are federal regulations in place that state things like they have to be able to push on the brake pedal before you shift from park into drive. What if your car doesn't have a brake pedal? Uh, you know, questions like that that need to be answered anyway. So they're basically making that pledge in Washington to say that we are being slowed down and hampered in our efforts to be innovative in this area. And the government, we'd like you to come in and make things easier. So that was the, the beginning of the discussion. We've got a long way to go, I think, where there wasn't really any resolution out of it. There wasn't that much fear-mongering, though, which I think was a good thing. Ultimately, I think it was a, pro a you know progressive discussion, a positive discussion on where we are, where we need to go, and the things that we need. And government seemed receptive. Uh, Secretary Fox, in particular, has been very, very uh, progressive in working with Google to help to redefine these laws. And hopefully we get something, uh, something changing in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, I was going to say, this must be music to a lot of car makers' ears because we've heard from a lot of the car makers at their senior level saying, look, the number one thing we need right now on self-driving to move forward is simple, single set of rules, the patchwork right. of U.S. states. It just about drives them all crazy. They all, they all tend to agree on that. Uh, and uh, related to self-driving, uh, this, uh, this is almost more amusing than anything else, but Google just got a patent on avoiding collisions with buses, which, of course, exactly what happened to it about yeah. a week or so ago. This yeah. was uh, this, These aren't related, of course, but this is school bus detection, which is interesting. It just goes to illustrate the ways that we have to teach cars uh, the various use cases on the road. And this one is so narrow. It says, you know, look for a vehicle of a certain size, uh, ECU. Look for yellow. Uh, do character recognition. See if you can spot any characters that say school bus on them. And if so, treat it with very great care. <laughs> it seems like a pretty natural sort of thing. I, I'm always amazed at the, the the number and the granularity you can get to in, in software patents these days. But, um, you know, hopefully Google is just kind of locking this down so that somebody else doesn't go and get a patent and try to charge money for it. That's, that's my hope. Yeah, they've patented yellow recognition and uh, nine <laughs> letters of the alphabet recognition. It's Next very interesting. Stuff, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really, really, really cutting edge. Uh, what I was surprised was I read, I just read the, uh, the the brief on this patent before it went way beyond my pay grade, but it was interesting that it didn't have anything in it about location or about time of day, which I would think is another way you can determine, is that a school bus? Am I on a school bus route? And is it during, you know, morning or early afternoon when school buses tend to ply the road? I didn't see any heuristics or anything like that. Maybe that's in a separate patent. All right, so let's take a look at, uh, when we come back, we're going to have updates on some of the latest things we've been doing with uh, the cars that are in our garage here at Roadshow. We're also going to tell you uh, how car makers are placing a hedge against Apple CarPlay and Google's Android Autos. We've been telling you that's a real frenemy mix there. We're going to update you on that when Autocomplete continues. Welcome back to Autocomplete from Roadshow. I'm Brian Cooley, editor-at-large, joined by our editor-in-chief, Tim Stevens, who uh, give us an update now. What are some of the top features and highlights on the site this week, Tim? Well, it's NSX week uh, on the side. We've got three separate features of the NSX, which uh, is a pretty great car. The new NSX is finally hitting dealers uh, in just a couple of weeks, actually. So first thing, we've got the, fir uh, the full first take, my driving impressions of the new NSX, which is a 573 horsepower supercar that, as I mentioned, is finally hitting dealerships. We've also got Emmy's tour of the manufacturing facility. They're actually being built in Ohio here in the U.S., which is pretty great to see. So you go behind the scenes and see how those cars come together. And finally... 
We've got a head-to-head -head shootout between the new NSX and the classic NSX with Graham Rahal, IndyCar driver, doing the doing the hot shoe stuff for us, which is pretty great. You will not want to miss that. So we've got those three great features. We've also got a full review of the 2016 Cadillac ATSV, and we introduce you to our long-term Mazda Miata, our first long-term car at Roadshow, which we're pretty excited to put through the paces. Okay, so that's all waiting for you at Roadshow. It's at theroadshow.com. Uh, if you are wondering about car makers relationship with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, you know, it's a little bit of one of friction. They want to bring those two platforms in because they reflect our smartphones pretty accurately and faithfully on the dash. At the same time, car makers don't want to give up their head unit real estate to some other company in terms of interface and in terms of uh, gathering all that data about usage. So this week, uh, Inrix, which does a whole lot of technology for head units and navigation, the consumers never know the name of. This is not a consumer-facing company, but it's a big supplier. They bought a company called Open Car uh, in Seattle, where I actually am this week. And the idea is to create an alternative to, AirPlay, um, to Android Auto and CarPlay so that there's yet another way to bring in apps and have them update common apps that we use out on the internet and on our mobiles into cars. It just... I guess I'm surprised by this to see that there's still this appetite to further fracture the space of hosting applications in the car when we already have three ways. The way the car maker's been doing it already, Apple, CarPlay, and Android, another one. Yeah, it, it's it's frustrating to me to say uh, to see how many different standards there are. My favorite saying, of course, is that the beauty of standards is that there are so many to choose from. But we just got one more new one to add on to the mix. Uh, you know, if you didn't want to go with Android Auto or with, uh, with Apple CarPlay, you could go with Ford Smart Device Link, which is now picked up by Toyota as well. That's you know got the best foothold outside of the Google and the Apple camp in terms of getting across multiple manufacturers. Uh, it's, you know, with Indrix on board, that means in theory we can go across multiple manufacturers too. But ultimately. It just seems like they've got a really steep road to climb. And it's, it's again, very unfortunate to add one more choice for developers to standardize against. And now they have to incentivize developers to come pick their platform or their, over other platforms. And I just don't see it. And also, Enrix, that same company, uh, Wayne Cunningham did a, did a talk to them about a new form of navigation they have called Autotelligent, which they're rolling out, which is their effort at offering to the car-making world uh, navigation that is going to be predictive. It's going to say, wait a minute, I can, I can see your calendar with permission, and I can then preload. I could also know that whenever you drive to a certain restaurant, you park in a, either a street or a garage nearby, I can preload that destination. So the idea that the navigation isn't just dumb and sitting there waiting for you to say, where should I take you now? But instead should be trying to get a little bit ahead of you and saying, look, I think I know what you want to do next. And here is a suggestion of how we do that. That I think is really smart. So again, same company doing something a little different there, uh, not related to the apps base we just talked about, but two things from Enrix, open car for apps and this auto intelligence navigation effort. You can read about how they uh, envision that over at Roadshow at theroadshow.com. Let's talk about a whole slew of new cars that we've got or, or updated cars. Uh, a lot of them are centered around the New York Auto Show, Tim. We've got, uh, for the first time in the U.S., if I understand it, we'll have a four-cylinder Porsche Macan coming that would, should debut at the show, uh, getting, uh, as I understand it, 2025 MPG. Right. So that's, I guess, if you want the Macan look and Macan handling, but not necessarily all the oomph from the other bigger cars, but you're still going to be paying a, a lot of money for it. I think the starting price on this guy is about 50 grand. So not a cheap crossover by any means. Yeah, this is uh, 252 horsepower, uh, t uh, turbocharged, inline four, 273 pound-feet of torque, zero to 60 and 6.1, so certainly good performance, but it's not uh, like you're going to get from any of the hotter versions, so it's interesting. It's uh, it's for those who want that look, that size, that, that crossover practicality, which is you know the hottest sector out there. We should be getting some kind of a, a very puzzling, potentially new Prius, uh, based on the one teaser image that Toyota sent out, and I think we have a look at that. Uh, it shows this interesting wraparound, apparently rear LED bar on a car that doesn't look at all like any Prius on the market. Do you have any idea what to make of this teaser? It's interesting. We just got a new Prius, so for them to be giving us another new Prius is interesting. But yeah. of course, in the last generation, we had multiple models of the Prius, so maybe that's that's what we're getting into now. Word on the street is that this will be a plug-in model, which is good. Um, you know, the, the last generation plug-in Prius didn't really sell very well, but Toyota never really put a lot of marketing behind it either. So uh, we'll we'll see what we get out of this. But you know, the, again, the expectation is a plug-in model. Maybe it's a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit more aerodynamic. Uh, it looks a little bit more curvaceous from that one little teaser image that we've got, but that's all we've got to go on right now.
Yeah, it's a very strange teaser from Toyota. So we'll be on top of that at New York Auto Show to see if we've got either a whole new model. Maybe they've decided to add a, a sexier coupe-like model to the line. I mean, that's always possible to try and sex mm -hmm. it up. Uh, the fact that it's got a dramatically different rear end, if this taillight teaser photo tells us something, means it has to be a different body flowing from that. Uh, we did just, as Tim mentioned, get the new standard hybrid Prius, which has, you know, some updated designs, some updated technology, but this uh, looks almost like another derivation of model shape and size. So that could be interesting. Also at the New York Auto Show, if you're interested in the future of cameras in vehicles, I don't think anything's a better indication than, than what the new Super Duty Ford truck is going to be offering with a camera in the front, camera in the back, camera at the top of the cab looking back, cameras looking back from both side view mirrors, and even a camera you can stick on the back of what your trailer pulling on the end of a very long cable. Uh, this is probably the most multi-lensed, multi-censored camera package I think we've ever seen on any vehicle. You know, it's interesting, just before we went live, Chevy actually sent out a Silverado press release with a very similar sounding system. In fact, they have oh, a really? camera that you can mount inside the trailer. So if you're towing horses, for example, and they want to see how they're doing, you can look inside the trailer too. So um, both the Chevy and Ford getting on the multiple camera thing. But, you know, if you've ever towed anything behind, especially a large trailer like a horse trailer, uh, you know, it takes up all of your rearward vision. So to have cameras on the outside will certainly make driving a lot easier. And it could make backing up a lot easier too, which is the biggest problem when you got a trailer behind you. Interesting. So a lot of cams come in the trucks. Uh, new Mercedes, or not Mercedes, new camera, uh, Camaro ZL1. Uh, we're going to see that guy with uh, a 640 horsepower blown 6.2 V8. Uh, Magna ride, their adaptive suspension will be standard on this ZL1, Apple CarPlay. But what's interesting about it, perhaps most uh, diverging from what you expect in a hot rod Camaro, is that the transmission choice will be either a six-speed manual that you would expect or... A 10-speed automatic, which is an unusual message in a muscle car where uh, normally a 10-speed automatic is used to kind of even out RPM variations to get the best efficiency, the lowest emissions. I guess that's probably why they're doing it here as well, to be honest, because even the hottest muscle car has to get cleaner and leaner. Right. We'll have to see what we can find out about the, the ratios that they're using in, in that gearbox. On the NSX, for example, they have a nine speed, but the way they positioned it, basically it's got a six speed in the middle that you'd use on the track with very closely spaced ratios and a real short first gear for acceleration and a really long ninth gear to get you best fuel economy on the highway. So if they've done something like this in the Camaro, maybe that'll work out for the best, both for performance and for economy. Uh, yeah, I'll have to wait and see on exactly where those ratios stand out. Interestingly, on the ZL1, the tease on it was probably one of the shortest teases I've ever seen. I think they launched the teaser video uh, the evening before, and then all the first impressions came out like three or four hours later. It was hardly, hardly teased at all. But, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, well, it looks nice, sounds nice, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it in New York next week. Yeah, it should look great. Hot looking car. Uh, let's see. We've also got, uh, we won't see this at New York just yet, but maybe in a future New York show, we would see a Mazda CX-4. Now, right now, Mazda's got their 3, 5, and 9 in the CX crossover line. But in China, uh, they're about to roll out uh, a CX-4, which will be a lower, sleeker-looking uh, version of their current crossover line on the smaller to mid-size range. I don't know offhand which platform it's based on, but the fact that it may very well come to U.S. and the rest of the world is, uh, is certainly possible. And I think it shows that, uh, at least for now, while fuel prices are where they are, and certainly in the Chinese market in general, there's no lack of appetite for any number of ways you can slice and dice and reinterpret what a crossover looks like. Yeah, it, it's crazy to think that uh, the Mazda is going to stick another one in there. But I, I got to say, I love it when a car has a, a name that makes sense. It's a little bit bigger than the CX-3. It's a little bit smaller than the CX-5. It fits in there quite nicely. I, I think it looks nice. It's got a you know a very, very stylish look to it, as most Mazdas do these days. And you know, I think it could do well here in the U.S., despite the fact that it is so close to those other two cars. Yeah, it's really they're really packing the line. Uh, again, if they do bring it to the U.S., right now it's a Chinese market car, but a lot of the buzz is that it will uh, leave there and hit the rest of the world. And finally, if you uh, you know, we get a lot of questions from people from time to time an email saying, you know, hey, is a certain car going to be a future collectible, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe here is one, as we've talked about for the last few, a couple of months, you know, Scion is being wound up. Uh, the cars, some of the models are being rolled into Toyota. Um, I believe they're going to change the name of the, um, of the let's see, the FRS uh, is going to make its way into the Toyota line as just the 86. The is that what I'm hearing? 
Yep, that, so that's what it's been called in Japan since the beginning. So it is going to live on, oh. which is good news. But, um, but that's what they're going to be calling it here in the U.S. now as well, which is you know a, a continuation of the AE86, which is kind of a classic drift car. That was what they uh, yeah. considered that car to be picking up on. So it's good that that, um, that car will live on. And uh, you know anybody who's a fan of uh, drifting anime from Tokyo will be a fan of that name too. We'll be very fond of that. And then the car that we think might be, uh, this is literally the swan song of Scion, is they'll be showing the last version of the TC. It is a, a mild modified 16 Scion TC release series 10.0 they'll call this one and it's basically a mild body kit it's going to have a freer flowing exhaust from the TRD catalog and also a set of lowering springs factory installed but if you're a big Scion buff and they're out there and you want to you know put one away on blocks for 10 or 20 years and then slap it on <laughs> eBay and try and retire this is it this could be the final you if you get the if you get late production maybe you get lucky and you can say I have the last Scion ever made or something pretty close to it so we wish we've got to look at that yes good luck with that and i hope it goes upside for you all right folks that's it for uh, our update on news of cars and technology this week from autocomplete don't forget to stay on top of everything as it breaks throughout the week at roadshow it's theroadshow.com check out our look at the uh, manufacturing center for the new acura nsx that's brand new on roadshow we got an early look at that as tim mentions in three pieces and then coming up as you're getting your ears pricked up for new york auto show news we're going to be all over that with comprehensive coverage as well thanks a lot we'll talk to you next week